We are talking today with Bruce Penwell of Bridgman, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, now Bruce, start us off with some background on yourself, and to begin with, where and when were you born? Payne, Illinois. Okay, and where is Payne, Illinois? It's south of Springfield, about 40 miles. Okay, now did you grow up there? No, I was, I lived in many several different places, including Kirksville, Missouri, Beecher City, Illinois, Peoria, okay. <laughs> Bloomington. <laughs> and, and what was your family doing for a living then? My uh, family, my father's side, let, let me say this okay. first. My mother and father were divorced okay. when we, and we children at that time went to live with our grandparents in Beecher City, Illinois, mm -hmm. and they had farms down there. And that's uh, what should uh, define why I lived in so many right. different places. I mentioned Bloomington, Illinois. At that time, my mother was supervisor of the Soldiers and Sailors Children's Home in Normal, Illinois. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, <clears throat> That is where she had an accident falling down steel steps of the administration building and she became paralyzed below the waist. And when did that happen? 36. Okay. All right. So that's the middle of the Depression and you're only 12 years old at that point. Uh, so, okay. Now, um, and then did you finish high school? At Beecher City, Illinois. Okay. I had two years at Kirksville, Missouri, mm -hmm. and finished at Beecher City, Illinois, where I also attend the second and third grade. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, now, uh, when did you graduate from high school? 42. Okay. Uh, now, do you remember how you heard about Pearl Harbor? I was visiting my father in Payne, Illinois. Uh, <coughs> at that time, he was uh, manager of one of the managers of our family department store, George Reed Penwell and Sons. Mm -hmm. And we had visitation and all that malarkey. Yeah. And um, we were coming home from a visit on Sunday and we heard it on the car radio. All right, uh, and then, now you're still in high school at that point, uh, and a little bit- Junior. Yeah. Junior. Okay, and a little bit too young to go into the service. Uh, so then, when you graduated from high school, what did you do next? Went to the University of Illinois, College of Agriculture. Okay. Uh, at that time, I went into the field artillery unit of ROTC, and we had uh, French 75s and 6x6 uh, six six prime movers, mm -hmm. which were 6x6 six six trucks. Right. Okay. Uh, now, had, did you consider enlisting in the military instead of going to college? No. Okay. I was college bound. I, all of my education was for a college entry. Okay. Uh, and, and Uncle Sam was okay with that. Did, did you have a deferment? Or was being an ROTC, was that good enough for that, the... That did it. Okay. All right. Because Uncle Sam got kind of impatient sometime and wanted more men more quickly. But you were able to stay in college for the full four years? No, for two years. Oh, two years, okay. Uh, and then after those two years of college, what did you do? That's going to be 1944 now, or? I went back home to Beecher City, and then I was drafted at Okay, but uh, at that point, did you actually go into the service, or? Were you there was a delay there, but okay. I can't remember how long. Okay. Uh, but did you then go into the service? Yes. Okay. 
Uh, and where did they send you? And now, were you going in as an enlisted man, or were you going to be an officer? Well, I lucked out. Since I'd had the ROTC, I went into the uh, uh, Armored Replacement Center at Fort Knox as a Lance Staff Sergeant. Okay. That's, that's the same as a platoon sergeant. Right. Okay. So you had you had some rank then. So you were not just yes, a private yeah. at that point. Okay. I didn't do KP. <laughs> All right. Uh, and now, what kind of training did you get at Fort Knox? I came out as a medium tank crewman. Okay. So did you? And what kind of tanks did you train with? What what kind of tanks did you have? We had M24 light tanks. We had M4 3E8, which was the uh, Sherman, mm -hmm. and we had the M26 Patton, mm -hmm. and we also had half tracks. Okay. All right. Uh, so this is probably then. This is like 1945. Then was this 1945? Yes. Okay. Uh, now was the war still going on at that point? When I went to Germany, no, no, it was over in May of 45. Right, okay. And so, when did you go to Germany? January of 46. Okay, all right. Um, uh, what do you remember about Fort Knox? Well, it, it was good duty, and being a last staff sergeant, <laughs> It gave me a little uh, boost. Okay. Uh, now, did you get to drive the tanks, or did you just ride it? Did them? everything on a tank. Okay. Uh, everything from the tracks up. That's how you came out a medium tank crewman. You were able to perform every function required. Okay. And what different jobs did were there? What different functions? Okay. Well, there are five people in a tank. There's the driver, the assistant driver, who's also a machine gunner. You've got the loader uh, radio man. You've got uh, the tank commander, of course, which can be any rank. And uh, you've got the gunner. Mm -hmm. Five people. All right. Did I mention five? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, now, how easy or hard was it to drive a tank? Very easy. I've spent so much time in vehicles before, it was mm -hmm. uh, uh, no problem at all. Okay. Now, there was one difficulty though, our half tracks had to be cranked, they didn't have starters. So you had to watch out for a broken arm, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, a kick. Right, okay. Uh, now did you like any of the tanks better than the others? Oh yeah, I liked the M4A3 E8, that, that Sherman, that, uh, Compared to a Panzer, it wasn't much, but uh, it's just like driving a Caterpillar. Okay. All right. Now, that, that tank, that at least had a long-barreled gun, though, right? That it had both a 75, a 76, mm -hmm. or a... Uh, <laughs> well, I don't think they had 90 millimeter yet. Say again? 90 millimeter? 90? You said 75, 76, and a 90, or just a long, no, 70, long the 75? the M26 had the 90, yeah. the M24 had the 75. Right. Uh, what's the gun that shoots? Oh, the howitzer. Howitzer. Oh, okay, right, because some of them had a howitzer on, sure. 105, mm -hmm. 105 howitzer. <laughs> yeah, okay, all right. Uh, so, you spend some time at Fort Knox, and then uh, they send you off to Germany, uh, how did they get you to Germany? The William and Mary Victory Ship. And what was that like? Uh, it was all right. Uh, things I remember, we had to stand up to eat. I served guard duty on the ship as if it were on land. Mm -hmm. now, what, I, yeah. I bought a steak sandwich from a guy in the uh, kitchen for 35 cents. 
<laughs> I shouldn't be saying this stuff. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I don't know. What, was the weather good? Say again? What was the weather like on the way over? Oh, not bad, but not smooth. Okay. Now, that was it, January. Yeah. In the North Atlantic. Mm hmm. Now, were there guys getting seasick? <laughs> oh, boy. No. I had a habit of getting seasick two or three days out. I was seasick for about a day, and uh, uh, then I, I got out of it. Mm -hmm. but it wasn't bad. Uh, the bunks were, were four high, I remember. Uh, it was good to be able to go on deck uh, because you could get, get up there, get some fresh air, get out of the, the stinky bunk area. Mm -hmm. I was I, I was top man, top bunk in that in that area. <laughs> All right, uh, and then where did you land? Lahar. Okay. Uh, and my first impression was the wrecks that were still in the water. There. Right. Okay. Uh, so now you you made it to France and. Um, what happens after you get off the ship? I went to Camp Lucky Strike. Have you heard of that before? <laughs> it's a transit camp. It's a transit camp. So, yes. Right? Okay. Uh, and and that was used for a lot of the guys who were going home, but you Both were using it, you were using it going the other way. I got it on a train that had been in Germany because there were German signs, mm -hmm. and my first sign thought. Uh, was uh, trying to define what some of the signs meant, but I could understand first, nicht rauchen, no smoking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so where did you go in Germany? Well, I've got something to tell on the way over to Strasbourg. Okay. That's where we went. Mm -hmm. um, we had a bunch of replacement 82nd paratroopers. <clears throat> we went down south of Paris, and we got there in the evening, and they had to do some switching to get us on the route to Strasbourg, France. <clears throat> some of the Paris, some of the paratroopers, stole the lanterns from the train guys. Well, you can't operate a train without people with lanterns. Mm -hmm. That allowed some of them to go to Paris <laughs> for a couple of hours. <laughs> so that was one of the most memorable things of them. <laughs> All right. The trip to Strasbourg. Uh, every time we'd stop, though, which and we stopped frequently for uh, track switching and that, mm -hmm. people would come up and so, offer to sell us things for cigarette, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was offered a beautiful stein. I just can't get over it. With a, it was a lithophane with a picture in the bottom of the stein. Mm -hmm. And I, I forget how much the person wanted for it, but I kicked myself for not buying that for a couple of packages of cigarettes mm -hmm. or maybe whatever it was. Anyway, we got to Strasbourg. From Strasbourg, we laid over there a while, I can't remember how long, and then went up to Bamberg, Germany. Okay. And then what unit did you join? <coughs> Six Corps Headquarters. Okay. And what was your job with them? What was your assignment? How long did I get it figured out? You won't believe this. They put me in a van. Back at Fort Knox, special services wanted people to try to entertain fellow troops for slow periods, weekends. And uh, I played the clarinet. And somehow that dropped out of my records. Mm -hmm. 
and they stuck me in the 114th AGF band. Well, in the billets, we were at a caserne, a horse caserne, and in the in the room I was in, there were six bunks, three on that side, three on the other side, and the guy on my left played the trumpet. He started practicing at six o'clock in the morning. I forget what the musician on my right was, but he was also an early riser. Well, I was really no musician, and I put up with that about as long as I could, and I, I went to see the CO and said, get me out of this outfit, I'm no musician. Oh, I know, the guy on my right played the French horn, and he played in uh, some major band in the United States. <laughs> I was not close to that class. Right. So anyway, I, they transferred me out. They said, what do you want to do? They offered me two or three opportunities. Motor pool. Give me the motor pool. I got in the motor pool, and uh, I was just a, a driver there for a while, maybe a couple of weeks. And then they assigned me to the Adjutant General Section headquarters. And then about that time, it changed over to headquarters U.S. Constabulary. And you know uh, what Adjutant General did in, in Germany. They ran the military government. So I was assigned a Mercedes-Benz uh, sedan, 1938 issue. And for about... 90% of the rest of my time in Germany, I was with the same vehicle and the same as the general section, traveling all over uh, Germany, U.S. zone. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I had an, ex had an experience uh, in Strasbourg, Germany. I, I had colonels who were more civilian than uh, military. And Colonel Hohertz was my favorite colonel. I had, I had two or three majors and two or three colonels at various times in this section. Mm -hmm. Colonel Hohertz from Nebraska, just a wonderful guy, said, told me one time, he said, Penwell, I'm, I'm going to France. I, I've got permission for you to drive me across the border into France and then come back to Germany. At Strasbourg, uh, we, we put him up in his room and I went to my room in the hotel. The next morning I got up, I went down, and there was a restricted parking lot for military vehicles. Well, I, for some reason, hadn't parked there. I parked out on the street, mm -hmm. which was very safe because the military was all around. I w went to the car and turned on the ignition. <laughs> Wouldn't start. Well, the PWs were working on the road, and they were driving trucks. So I flagged one of them down. I said, come over here. And then he knew what my problem was. I said, you pull me and uh, we'll start the car. Well, having a lot of experience with vehicles, that's what we used to do. <laughs> You'd either be pulled and pushed and it would start. Well, he, he hooked a tow, tow rope or chain. I forget what it was. It wasn't a log chain. It must have been a rope. He hooked it to the front bumper. So I said, okay, well, this PW was no friend of a GI. Mm -hmm. He jumped the truck, lifted the 
front end right up off of its uh, <laughs> bolts. The front fender, the headlights, and the radiator went up in the air. The hardest thing I ever do, I had to do in my life was go tell the old man mm -hmm. that we didn't have any vehicle left. Well, for, fortunately, they made Mercedes-Benz at Bad Konstadt, which was a suburb of Strasbourg. And they had a, a GI uh, motor vehicle plant over there that was a, attached to it. And the old man found out that we could get the, my car repaired over there. So he took off by train to where his destination was. So I went to Bad Konstadt and registered in, and the guy in the, uh, the uh, motor pool said, I don't know what we're going to do for a radiator. We, can't, we can stick the uh, fenders back on and the headlights, but we don't have a radiator. Well, <coughs> as I said, Mercedes-Benz had a plant mm -hmm. in Bad Konstadt. So we got in the Jeep and went over there. And they had my radiator. And some, I think we dealt with some watchman there because it was completely dead. How much do you want for the radiator? Uh, dry pocket cigarette. <laughs> so I bought a Mercedes Benz radiator for three packs of cigarettes. <laughs> they, they glued everything back together and I took off for home base. <laughs> okay. Uh, just to clarify something, when you talked about the guy who pulled the radiator off of the car, you referred to him as a PW. PW. Prisoner of war? Or oh yeah, P PWs were everywhere. Okay. So you still have... Working on roads, walking down highways with the big PWs on them. And uh, I was stupid enough not to realize that that guy wasn't going to do me any favors. <laughs> I don't know. Wait, generally, how did the German people treat you? Very well. They didn't have any choice. Mm -hmm. And they were beat down. They were beat. Utterly exhausted. Mm -hmm. okay. And um, was the economy still in bad shape at that point? Terrible. People were still hungry. And there were millions of people on the move, displaced persons, mm -hmm. and the PWs, German civilians. Every th every body was just moving everywhere. Trains. It, well, I had an experience trying to get on a plane, a train, and I wasn't going to get up there hanging out the door. I, I wasn't able to do that. But it was uh, tough for the civilians. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and what, um, now as you were driving, did you encounter any uh, kind of higher ranking people or generals and things who were famous? I mean, while you were in Germany, did you see any of the higher commanders? Like a Mark Clark or anybody like that? I was offered to drive, an opportunity drive for General Harmon who was commander of headquarters U.S. Constabulary. Mm -hmm. But I knew that if you drove for a general, the, the general's aides were the ones you really drove for because the general was always somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And you were taking the general general's aides to see their girlfriends. Mm -hmm. I turned that down <laughs> too sweet. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, now, are there other um, particular things that you remember about that time in Germany? Very definitely. I attended the war crimes trials twice. Rader was on the stand one time, and Dernitz was on the stand the other time. It was about two or three weeks apart. And what I remember them discussing was the German order to not save any persons they had uh, that were still alive in the water. Okay. The one, so whose ships had been sunk by U-boats? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because they were these were both admirals, and Raider was commander of the Navy, and Dernitz was commander of the submarines mostly. That is correct. Yeah. And he was he's also the one that signed the peace treaty, right. I believe. Right. Because he was sort of so Hitler's was, replacement, yeah. And then uh, Gehring sitting there like that. Hess was beside him. It was a quite uh, and it left quite an impression on me. You had a little dial beside you, four languages. You could flip around. And there were over fifty or sixty seats in the gallery. So if I hadn't been with Adjutant General Military Government, mm -hmm. I would have never gotten in. Right. But I remember the enlisted man's mess. It was for all French, uh, Russian, British, English, and American. And they would open at about 11 and close at maybe two or three. But these 14 year old, I'm saying that age, Russian soldiers would come in. maybe 20 medals on their chest. And the beer was lousy, it was 3.2 beer. <laughs> and they would start at 11 o'clock. And if you went back there at 2 or 3 when they closed, they'd still be sitting there drinking that lousy beer. Uh, so that was quite an impression. Kids! <laughs> All right, okay. Uh, and, and other things that you remember other things that happened in Germany? They had marks when I got there, German-American marks. They changed it over to script. And we were alerted to get your currency control book in order because they were going to make the exchange. Mm -hmm. but working in the motor pool, we had, uh, we had no American vehicles. We had all Amer German vehicles or mm -hmm. French vehicles. And we had the, the German or French mechanics to go along with them. I was alerted by a German mechanic who had headed up that department in the motor pool. He said, he, he alerted me before it was announced. Well, cigarettes then were worth about $40 a carton. I think I was $30 short on my currency control bill. That meant that I'd received that much money, but I didn't have mm -hmm. it. It was, it was uh, spent. Mm -hmm. Well, this German mechanic also traded in cigarettes. So I ended up with breaking even on my currency control book, <laughs> which I shouldn't be telling on there, but it's, it's I don't think you'll get in trouble now. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so how long did you spend in Germany? How long were you in Germany? January. Uh, we went to Bremerhaven on a troop train. Bremerhaven. And the ship we were going home on was at dock, but the canal had frozen over. It was cold, very cold winter. It had frozen over, so we didn't get out maybe middle of January because of the weather. But on New Year's Eve, the, the troops were staying in Luftwaffe hangars, giant hangars, and they had some steam pipes around the side, but 
it was 32 degrees in the middle of the building. So what they did is they passed out your choice of liquor, New Year's Eve. And that's one thing the military <coughs> did. They kept everybody well supplied with liquor mm -hmm. at that time. So it was, we were in double bunks. And the guy above me or below me, I forget which, had been in Graves Registration. He was an undertaker by choice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> they said, they told us, you two guys get in the lower bunk and put the blankets down on each side and you'll be just as warm as toast. Mm -hmm. Which we did, and the two bottles of liquor didn't hurt any. <laughs> All right. Now, was this January of 49 when you left? No. Or? 40, 47. Okay. So basically you were there one year? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Um, and then uh, what was the trip back to the States like? It was a president trip ship. I don't remember the name of it. A match, M-A-T-S. Okay. Yeah, you know what I'm talking yes. about. Yeah, exactly. I don't remember her name, right. but it was uh, deluxe. Okay, so it's a much, much better ship to be on than a Liberty ship. Oh yes, v Victory. Okay, Victory. That's ship. a step up. Yeah, from bigger. Liberty. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now what? And then what? So and was that an easy trip back, or did you get sick again, or? No, not much. It, it, uh, I did. Ha I did have to serve KP, and I remember my my duty was cutting up blocks of butter. It, you probably are familiar with that machine. You press it down, and it makes butter squares. Mm -hmm. Well, this block of butter was loaded with roaches. Oh! Every cut I'd make, I'd see three or four roaches in the slab that was cut off. Unbelievable. I don't know how, how that many roaches could get in a block of butter, <laughs> but somehow they did. But there was one significant thing coming back that was, it sticks in my memory. We came through the channel. I got to see the limestone of Britain there. Yeah. And we were coming through there, maybe we had left. England, all side of England. Mm -hmm. I don't recall, but the ship stopped. The troop ship stopped. What's going on? Well, there's a tanker ahead of us in trouble. And we have stopped to offer them help. Well, I was able to get away from my butter cutting, get up on deck to see what was going on. And it turned out that this was one of the ships that was going to Palestine filled with Jews. Mm -hmm. And they refused our help. They said, we'll, we'll get this old trap steamer going again. And believe it or not, there were no, they had no people on deck. It was just like a ghost ship there. Mm -hmm. They kept all the people downstairs, below decks. Okay. But did you learn that at the time? At the time, yeah. Okay. Because the Jews were still in such, with, with the uh, concentration camp mm -hmm. thing, uh, it was still quite common talk. As a matter of fact, in Germany, there was a compound of displaced Jews. And uh, they wouldn't allow, well, maybe certain hours. I've seen them walking around the outside of the compound, but they were pretty well restricted, never out during the hours of darkness. Mm -hmm. Okay, because and this is 1947, so this is before Israel has been established at this point, and there was still a question of what was going English to happen. English still had control. Yeah. Yeah, so it's still kind of touchy at that point uh, for who was going there. Okay. Uh, now, when you got back to the States, uh, did you stay in the Army or did you get discharged? I got out. Okay. So that's 47. Fort Sheridan. Okay. So that's 1947 now that you're getting out? 
Okay. Now, did you remain in the reserves, or did you no. go back to college, or? Um, I signed up to go to summer school. Okay. Back back to College of Agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just bummed around for a couple of months. I worked in the store, in the department store, two or three times, but uh, I didn't have to. Mm -hmm. And I was waiting for summer school to start. Right. I did make one big error, though. I bought a Plymouth coupe for $700. <laughs> and the man that paid 600 for it knew. Oh. <laughs> You couldn't buy cars then. You couldn't find cars because they weren't making them fast enough. So anyway, I think I sold it for three hundred or three fifty, because they wouldn't allow school uh, cars on campus oh. unless they had a need. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, when you went back to school, did you also go back to ROTC? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, and then when did you graduate from college? 1950. Okay. Uh, and then once you graduated, did you now take a commission or go in the reserves, or what did you do? Well, you were given a commission. Okay. And you were automatically in the reserve because that was part of the deal. Right. To get your commission, okay. you also were in the reserve. Okay. Now, did you have to go for any Army training at that point, or did you just...? Well, there was one summer of summer camp mm -hmm. during school. Yeah. Fort Riley, Kansas, Kansas. Fort Funston was the uh, organization I was in. Mm -hmm. um, we were in with a bunch of cadets from New Mexico, which was very interesting because, you know, those Western guys are all characters. Maybe they think out of us, but <laughs> Midwesterners, but uh, it was quite enjoyable. And uh, on the weekends, we had Saturday and Sunday off, of course. And July 4th was spent in Kansas City. And uh, it was a enjoyable trip. Uh, I had a buddy named Carpenter, Ed Carpenter, and we decided to, to uh, hitchhike to the West Coast after summer camp. So we started out in Abilene, Kansas. First we went to see Ike's home, and then we got back on the road to the next town. I forget what, where it was. Well, by golly, people left town, we had, they'd wave to us as they went by, keep, go, keep on going. Two hours later, three hours maybe, we were standing in the same place, they were coming back, they'd still wave to us. <laughs> <laughs> so Ed and I decided Abilene was not the place to leave from, so we went down to the bus station and caught a bus ride to uh, Salt Lake City. We got in Salt Lake City. I had a fraternity brother that was going to work in a bar named Al, Al Bebot. And I told Al, I said, well, if I ever get to Reno, uh, I said Kansas City, I meant Reno. If I ever get to Reno, I'll look you up. So Ed and I went to Reno. That's where we went to from Abilene. Okay. Abilene to Reno, that, that was it. Well, walked into this bar and I asked the bartender, hey, do you know Al Bebot? <laughs> that SOB, I never want to see him again. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't follow up on Al Bebot much after that. But anyway, we, we went to Salt Lake City next, Sacramento, San Francisco. And that's where we did the sightseeing, the, mm -hmm. uh, the baseball players' place, uh, DiMaggio's. Mm -hmm. DiMaggio had a restaurant there, which was a tourist trap, but it was quite interesting. I know one night we went to a, a 
small hotel or just a restaurant called the Robin Hood, and they had a polka band there. And I love polka music, and Ed didn't think much of music at all. But anyway, he took off to the hotel, and uh, there was a German sailor there who was sitting there enjoying the music, and we, we met a couple of girls there. I don't know if we even did any polka dancing, but uh, that was about the end of that. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, but that was the summer uh, while you were still in college? Yes. Okay, and then when you graduate then, 1950, okay, what did you do next? Did you take a job or? Oh yeah, I interviewed several people and I signed up with Illinois Agricultural Association as a <coughs> special agent, special insurance agent. Mm -hmm. So I took their course, qualified, but they offered me choices of a couple of territories. And I chose Pekin, Illinois. Well, Pekin, Illinois is the uh, headquarters of the of Tazewell County courthouses in Pekin. I didn't realize that the farm community in Tazewell County is predominantly Mennonite. Mennonites do not believe in life insurance, which I didn't know until I got to Tazewell, to the Mennonite mm -hmm. section. I hadn't qualified to write insurance in May when all of the crop insurance was written, so it was out of the picture. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I made calls for two or three months, and I told Abby, I'm getting out of this. And I was also thinking about being called active duty. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, I went to Peoria to Armour and Company's packing plant. Well, being an old ag guy, I fit right in there. And uh, they sent me to LaSalle after, LaSalle, Illinois, after uh, training in the plant for a few weeks. But I learned all about uh, the packing business, moved to LaSalle. I was up there until March of 51? Yeah, when I was recalled active duty to Louisiana. All right, so uh, now you're, you're back in the Army, the Korean War is going on, uh, and they need people. All right, so where did you go in Louisiana? Fort Polk, down south of Alexandria, mm -hmm. near Lake Charles. All right, and what did you do there? I was a platoon leader, second platoon, Baker Company, 773 Tank Battalion. Okay, and what kind of tanks did they have? We had the Sherman M4A3 E8s, mm -hmm. and I th we, did, we had 120s. We had one patent, 26. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So these were all things you were familiar with from yeah. uh -huh. your original training. Okay. Um, and how long did you stay there? Till November of 51. Okay. So. Uh, I did get to attend, uh, as you know, when you're in a company, you're assigned many, many jobs, which you may or may not have any training for. Mm -hmm. Because I remember I was the, uh, appointed the chemical officer, the, the, the postal officer, and the mess officer. Well, 
they did send me to the Third Army Food Service School. Mm -hmm. So I know I've always enjoyed cooking, as Dick knows, and uh, that was an enjoyable six weeks or whatever it was. Okay. Now, were they training you uh, as a cook or to supervise the kitchen? Or? Supervisor. Right. As a mess officer. Right. See, I, I was already a mess officer, mm -hmm. but I hadn't been trained as a mess officer. All right. All right. Uh, so you're there basically about eight months, uh, and then it's time to go overseas. Right. Okay. So, so they gave me a delay of, in route of 30 days, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And I reported to Camp Stoneman, San Francisco, December 5th of that year. Yeah, 51. Okay. Uh, and then um, do they send you by ship to Korea or yeah. Japan or where do you Another go? Another president's ship. Okay. We went underneath the Golden Gate Bridge, which was left an impression. Mm -hmm. Nice smooth trip. The, the Pacific was peaceful. Mm -hmm. We arrived in Tokyo. I was sent to Camp Drake. And we got there the day before New Year's, so mm -hmm. it was a good time to arrive. Oh, we, we stopped at Okinawa. Mm -hmm. We had to let off Air Force dependents. And believe it or not, I can say that I've been to Ikana Okinawa because they, they told the troops that if you wanted to get off here on the dock and get back on almost immediately after to say you've been mm -hmm. on Okinawa, you could do so so. Okay. I grabbed at that. <laughs> and also memorable was we have staterooms. Six officers in a stateroom. I had four Green Berets, a, de a black dentist, and myself. Well, these ber Berets were all over the ship, and they were all, they, they spent their time garroting each other, sneaking up, you know, from around the corner, around the neck. I, I never knew there was that much garroting tra mm -hmm. garroted training in, <laughs> in my life. <laughs> but anyway, they were wonderful guys, but they kept in shape physically. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, the Green Berets as an organization hadn't really been established yet. I think Kennedy did that. So these may have been Rangers or some kind of special forces? Yeah, they were special forces. I, I said Green Berets. Yeah. Whatever they were, they right. were special yeah. troops. Right. I think of them now after the name Green right, Beret right. pops to my head. But no, they weren't Green Berets, they were Special Forces. Right, okay. All right. Now, um, what did you do while you were in Japan? Went to Chemical, Biological, Radiological Warfare School at Gifu, and we were stationed in a kamikaze training base. I have never seen such luxurious rooms and we each had an individual room mm -hmm. and a little shrine in the corner. The shrine wasn't there but the, the little stand. And uh, they, they really treated these kamikaze trainees well. Okay. Uh, and then what did the sort of chemical biological training actually consist of? What were they teaching you? Well, they teach us all the toxic chemicals, all the toxic bacteriologicals uh, through the water, through through the air, and uh, the radiological training is a room, a square room with a round circle, and in the center was a lead cylinder, and a pipe came out of it with a hook on the end, a circle to grab it, and uh, 
that's where we're, they taught us how to read a Geiger counter. Mm -hmm. I had, uh, I'm going to tell it anyway. I had thyroid cancer. I happened to tell my endocrinologist this story. He said, did you read the rate, the Geiger County? I said, oh yeah, we watched it go up and down as we moved around to various positions. He said, do you know radiation can cause thyroid cancer? He said, do you want to follow up on investigation? No, I don't want to. But I thought that was interesting for him to say that. Right. Well, well, we still didn't know that much about the effects of radiation poisoning. I mean, even after well, Hiroshima. they knew that it had to be in a lead cylinder, mm -hmm. and you lifted it up, and you didn't yeah. go near it, only with the Geiger counter, so you could read how many right. Rentgens you were getting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so now, um, when do you go to Korea? After the course, I forget how many weeks it was, four or six weeks, I don't know. Okay, so we're now, got, we've gotten into early 1952 now. Yes, we were in 52. Okay. We went down to Sasebo, across to Busan. Mm -hmm. On the way we went through, I can't remember the map now, but Hiroshima or Nagasaki, mm -hmm. but they wouldn't let us off the train. Right. There wasn't anything to see there. Mm -hmm. But I do remember that. So that would have been Hiroshima, because that's on the same island as Tokyo. And, and well, Nagasaki is in the far south of Japan. On okay, the south so island. it must have been Hiroshima. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. you're right. All right. Uh, and then you sail, you sail to Pusan. Then you get to Pusan in Korea. Yeah. And then what happens? Where do you go in Korea? Went into a rough old depot. And uh, after running us, run our, running our files through analysis, that's, they put you on a train and mm -hmm. sent you north. Okay. And I went to uh, Seoul and then from Seoul to Chuncheon. Okay. And then what unit did you join there? Ninth Corps Headquarters. Okay. And what was your job there? My first job was a uh, combat liaison officer, and then I was, after two or three months of that, I was put into G2 operations, uh, intelligence, collection, evaluation, dissemination, intelligence information uh, operations. Okay. okay, so what does a combat liaison officer do? My number one job was replacing other liaison officers. Uh, people would go on R and R. They had to, you had to have a man to replace them. So I was in the Central Corps. I Corps was on the left. Tenth Corps was on the right. In both of those, I was a replacement officer. Mm -hmm. And then. When I was in the base, I lived in a tent with two Korean liaison officers. Our, our main job was communication. We would attend a six o'clock briefing, go back to the tent, get on our assigned telephone, call, head, call back to headquarters, what we received for the briefing. And during the day, they would send us on little trips. It was just that at the end, they were leisure because there was really no assignment. Uh, one afternoon, I, I remember we watched uh, uh, some test vehicles. One had was an armored Jeep, and they would demonstrate things like that. But. Uh, it was cold, and we John Boo, the snow was that deep. So keeping warm was part of the job. 
Okay, so you're a liaison between American units or between Americans and Koreans or? American units. Okay. Yeah. So you're just keeping them in contact with each other so everybody knows what the other ones are doing. Right. Okay. All right. And, and then as G2 operations officer, I was on the other side from the enemy po standpoint mm -hmm. as, a po as opposed to G3, which is a friendly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so what do you do then as a G2 officer? I spent most of my time on night duties. I'd say I spent at least four months of my time on night duty. And then they would send you off on little trips. I would go to Well, I'll give you one example. The 773rd Tank Battalion by that time had arrived in Korea. Mm -hmm. And I had a friend named Bach from Texas A&M. And Bach's, company, Bach's platoon had seen action in the MLR, Main Line of Resistance, and he saved a tank crew whose track had been blown by something. Mm -hmm. And the guys came out the bottom and he got them in his bottom up into the tank. And my cup, my, uh, my uh, officer, trying to think of his name, had me on a plane the next morning to the 773rd Tank Battalion, which by that time was changed to the 73rd Tank Battalion. And LL-19s, which you're familiar with light planes like a, any other light plane, mm -hmm. um, were our, were our uh, jeeps, because okay. you couldn't go anywhere on roads because there were main roads, but there was nothing else with all the darn mountains. So I spent a lot of time in L-19s flying to mm -hmm. locations, like going up to see Lieutenant Brock and interviewing him, saying hello to some of my friends. As a matter of fact, somewhere in here there's a picture. Is that the there, thing there? Uh, uh, no, no. That's, that's the L-19, right. yes, and that's Captain Butler, a G-2 friend. This is our tank battalion in Korea mm -hmm. from the air, from one of those. Mm -hmm. I was able to shoot that. You can see how the tanks are displaced there. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, so I guess what was your sort of regular job like or your regular routine? Well, the first thing I had to do was start in on the PIR, Periodic Intelligence Report. And I was also assistant briefing officer. When Captain Barrick, the regular briefing officer, was away, I would sub for him. Mm -hmm. First thing I started on PIR, that was the intelligence report, which would had all the essential information of the day's activities. Mm -hmm. So I had to talk to the divisions on my left, divisions on my right. At one time, the 7th Division bayonet was on our left, and 3rd uh, Division was on our right. So I, they would call me. If I didn't hear from them, I'd have to call them. Mm -hmm. And then this would give me notes to start putting together. And I had one interesting phone call and a guy from 3rd Division called. Uh, he, I didn't recognize his voice. I said, is this John or Pete or whoever I've been talking to, the G2 officer from 3rd Division headquarters? He said, no, this is John Eisenhower. Oh. Captain John Eisenhower. Mm -hmm. 
But anyway, I thought that was interesting. Well, John Eisenhower was in G3, but the G2 guy was gone, so, but he happened to be substituting mm -hmm. for him. So I put this together, and then at 8 o'clock, around 8 o'clock, I'd receive a phone call. This is Tempest 6, what's going on? Oh, this was our commanding officer. Uh, Colonel, uh, General, anyway, I can't even pull it up. But anyway, I would give him essentially the PIR, mm -hmm. what we were going to give to pub the publicity in the right. morning at the briefing. Mm -hmm. So I uh, uh, finished that and then just Finally, getting the thing put together so we could get copies mimeographed off to hand off at briefing in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, that's about it. Okay. All right. Now this tape is almost up, so I'm going to pause right here and rewind and reload. So, yeah. All right. Now we've been talking about your service in Korea. And you mentioned that you shared a, a tent or a barracks with a couple of Koreans. Yes. What impression did you have of the South Koreans that you worked with? Well, neutral and bad. Okay. I had a bad experience when I was a liaison officer, I was given a special job of policing an area before we put uh, people in it. The engineers had gone over it first with the, the big identification equipment. So mine detectors, yeah. And my outfit had to pick up the potato mashers. Mm -hmm. So they gave me a, a medic, they gave me a sergeant who happened to be from my home, uh, near my hometown, and a sergeant, and an interpreter. Mm -hmm. So what they were doing was establishing a middle base for the 9th headquarters. Our home base was Chunchan. We were at forward 9th Corps, forward Tempest, and they wanted a base in between. So that's the area they showed. It had a nice creek going along with it. The engineers who were down the road, maybe two or three miles, had put in a tent for me as a headquarters tent, a tent for the troops and the interpreter. And the interpreter was a Japanese. Well, the first night, oh, excuse me, we all got, oh, went, retired the first night. Everything was very smooth. Woke up the next morning, the interpreter was gone. We had a, assigned to us uh, a platoon of walking injured mm -hmm. Koreans. Well, I know why they gave us walking injured, because what's another injury? They wouldn't lose any able troops. Mm -hmm. So here I was. I had the Korean troop commander, whatever he was, a lieutenant, captain, whatever, who spoke no English. I spoke no Korean. None of my troops spoke Korean. So I got on the horn and called uh, headquarters. A colonel had sent me down there. I can't think of the man's name. So I told him what the situation was. I tried to get these troops 
to do to start, which they did start by just hand motion. Mm -hmm. And I told told the old man what the situation was. I should remember his name. But anyway, he said, okay, I'll take care of a Pemo. One of the problems I had with the guy, they, they wouldn't complete their slit trench, which I, we had instructed them to. <laughs> and anywhere, you know, they felt like it. If it was the main path, down went the trousers. So anyway, in the middle of the second day, or the third day, in the middle of the third day, I still hadn't heard from the Colonel and the reason I haven't heard from him, he died. <laughs> oh. Just like that heart attack, I guess. So, my message to headquarters about my situation sort of got screwed up. Mm -hmm. It didn't get to the right people right. because the old man had died. Anyway, the third day, middle of the day, all of a sudden, there's this helicopter up here coming down over the creek into our area. The combat engineers had strung the telephone wire across the creek mm -hmm. between the road and the base without putting markers on it. Oh. Here comes the helicopter. Yeah! The helicopter pilot at the last minute saw the telephone wire going across the creek. Mm -hmm. The old man, Wyman, General Wyman was mm -hmm. our commanding officer. He didn't say a word to me. He was so P.O.'d. And I don't blame him. Mm -hmm. Anyway, after he left, I went down to the engineers and we had markers on the telephone wire within an hour. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but anyway, the fact that the Japanese left me mm -hmm. in the lurch, well, you know a Japanese soldier with a Korean platoon of injured troops mm -hmm. isn't going to last very long. But anyway, that's that story. Well, do you think that the Japanese uh, interpreter just left, or did the Koreans uh, reply? No, he, I think he left on his own, mm -hmm. because the writing was on the wall. When he saw those 19 or 20 guys that, uh, you know, mm -hmm. they were all in pain. Mm -hmm. okay. So, the, yeah. all right. and then also, another time, I told you I was with liaison officers mm -hmm. in a tent, and one one night the MPs came in, went straight to his bunk, jerked, jerked him out of bed, threw some clothes on him and marched him out in handcuffs. He was doing something very, very illegal. Mm -hmm. So that was another experience I had with the Koreans. Okay. Now, did but you, yeah. By the same token, it wasn't all bad. Mm -hmm. I would go to Korean division units on the MLR area and they were just as nice as pie. Well, uh, they were eating our food, taking our pay. Mm -hmm. But good luck. Mm -hmm. So that, that's why I felt that way about Orientals. Okay. Now, did you um, ever get to go off base? Could you go into Seoul or do anything else like that? I went down to Seoul. I flew down to Seoul uh, with the pilot. Uh, and then, of course, the trips up to the division and, mm -hmm. and to, to the tank battalion. Um, we operated with J, what was called JOC, and that was the Air Force. Mm -hmm. Joint Operations Command was in Seoul. So we would talk to these guys on the phone, at night especially, and they sent, sent us down two or three hours to meet these people mm -hmm. when we were talking with in Seoul. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was just a one day trip down, one day trip, and a day and back the same day. But they were very nice. And the reason we had contact with, with them at night is because 
B-29s would bomb North Korea at night and uh, they would fly out of Okinawa and they'd do their mission and then about an hour or so after they, we heard them fly back, uh, we would get a notification on the teletype where they bombed and other critical information for us to put it in the periodic intelligence report. So that was our connection with Joint Operations Command. Okay. Uh, now, how close did you actually get to the fighting? I mean, were you ever in a place where there was fighting going on, or were you always away from that? I was always in a very good position. One thing happened, I was up at 40th Division Headquarters in, the, in their bunkers one day, visiting, meeting the guys I was doing mm -hmm. business with. Um, and uh, you could look out, you just looked out on open space. You didn't see anything over there. They were, they were in caves, they were in, mm -hmm. they were in the ground, in the daylight hours. Mm -hmm. There were very few firefights in the daylight hours while I was there. Mm -hmm. There was much more action after I left with Port Chop Hill, which you're familiar with, than when I was there. There was, there was always action, four or five fire nights, firefights every day, but these were on listening posts, on mm -hmm. outposts, or uh, going to pick up a prisoner, you know, a North mm -hmm. Korean prisoner. That's what we have, mm -hmm. for the most part. There are two or three company actions, but... Okay, but there's no big pushes going on from either side during that time? No, not yeah. much more after I left. Right, okay. Uh, so when did you leave? Was it the end of 52 or early 53? November, I got to Pusan. Mm -hmm. And I was there two or three weeks till the ship came. And then we went across to Sasebo, Japan. And uh, we were there a while. And then we got a, on a president troop ship back to uh, Seattle. Okay. Now, so you were there less than a year? What? You were in Korea for less than a year? Yeah, I left Japan, I think, maybe in end of February or mm -hmm. March. From March till November I was in Japan. Okay. I guess at the time, now were you supposed to have a full year of overseas service? Or? No, you're supposed to have points. Okay. You had to have, earn 45 points to come home. Okay. And it took me that long to earn my 45 points. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So now, um, coming back, are you going to be out of the Army or do you have to stay in the Army a while longer? When I got back, my wife mm -hmm. said if you, if you stay in active reserve or the non-active reserve and are called again, you won't be here. Mm -hmm. I won't be here when you come home. So I didn't join the reserve. Besides that, I traveled all the time, and it would have been so difficult to make meetings. Mm -hmm. I was in the Reserve Officers Association. We went to several dances mm -hmm. and participated, but uh, I wasn't in the reserve officially. Okay. Well, when did you officially get discharged? Was that early 53? You weren't discharged. Okay. You were separated from the service. All right. And I couldn't voluntarily get out of res being a reserve mm -hmm. officer at that time. Maybe two or three later, two or three years later, I got my letter of service, okay. Well, separation. Okay. Well, I guess when you got back from Korea, did you get to go home or were you done at that point or did you have to go to another base somewhere? 
We landed in Seattle. Oh God, I can't remember the name of the camp, but I was there two or three days. Well, Fort and Lewis is the big army base there. It wasn't Fort Lewis. It's it's a it was a fort downtown okay. that is now extinct. Mm -hmm. I want to say Camp Drake, but I was in Camp Drake in no, Tokyo. That, that's Japan. Yeah. Uh, okay. Anyway, all right, but, it, but it's but anyway, not Seattle. Yeah. In Seattle, I was made troop commander of a train, mm -hmm. train troop commander. I had 103 guys. I had a couple of sergeants that did all the work. Real good guys. Mm -hmm. I got to Camp Carson, Colorado, signed in. You're missing three troops. Well, they jumped ship somewhere between Camp Carson, Colorado, and Seattle. Mm -hmm. It took us about three days to get there. But these guys were loaded with money. They hadn't seen a woman in. <laughs> you can't blame them for jumping ship. All right, so after Camp Carson, then what? Do they let you out or? I was sent home and arrived in Chicago Christmas Eve. They planned it, you know, to get us home mm -hmm. as soon as they could. Okay, and then at that point, were you separated or from the service or did you have to go somewhere else? No, that. That was it. When I left Fort Sheridan, well, I didn't have I didn't even have to go to Fort Sheridan. I was separated actually from the service mm -hmm. in Camp Carson, Colorado. Okay. I didn't have to report it to anybody then. All right. Okay. So then, once you once you were out, uh, what kind of career did you go into? There again, I tried many different things. I'm essentially a salesman. I'm a peddler. Okay. And I was a traveling salesman. I was on the road four or five days a week, attending conventions, sales meetings, on weekends. Okay. All right. Uh, and I guess to I want to sort of close out the story here. Uh, when you think back about the time that you spent in the service. Uh, what do you think you learned from that or how did it affect you? I was very lucky. I ended up doing what I always, what I wanted to do. I don't know whether that was fate or what it was, but I was lucky. Mm -hmm. I lost my company commander in Korea, Lieutenant Ami, and the, for the first platoon leader lost to Lay. Mm -hmm. that, that shows how lucky I was. Okay. Were they just up? Was this in a, in a combat situation? Yes, or? both combat. Oh, okay. One was mine and the other I don't know, but. Mm -hmm. He went ahead of me to Korea. Okay. Lieutenant Ami from Louisiana. Okay. So these are the men from the tank battalion. These are the men from the tank battalion. Yeah. Okay. When no. I was in Camp Polk. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because they they wound up as combat troops and you were not. So remember that. Okay. Now, do you think that um, the experiences that you had in the army helped you later on in life? Or oh, I'm sure it did. Responsibility. All right. Well, you've got an interesting story. So thank you very much thank for you. taking the time to share it today. Would you like to take a picture of these? Uh, that probably won't come out particularly well with this, but thank you.